You're listening to Westchester Talk Radio, produced by Shark Creative and made possible by Antergy, Indian Point Energy Center, supporting the community through spring 2021. I'm Bob Marone for Westchester Talk Radio, and we're with High Tower Westchester once again. Indeed, I'm here with Peter Lang. Peter is the managing director and partner at High Tower Westchester. Today's topic is not a pleasant one, but it is what it is, and it's that one half of every married couple will face at some point in our lives death of a spouse. Peter, thanks, Bob. Um, and yeah, this is not an easy or pleasant topic. I know a lot of times you and I have some great banter when we're going through these things. I think this one based upon the topic will be a little less so. Um, and look, we deal with this, unfortunately, from where we sit as clients, you know, wealth advisors, we deal with this on a, you know, on a somewhat regular basis. Um, you know, death of parents, death of siblings, and, and death of a spouse. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the death of a spouse is probably a little different than, than others. Um, and I think there are, with the way we look at it, there are kind of four main things that everyone has to deal with. One, of course, is the emotional grief, the family surrounding them. Of course, then there's the financial, which is really where we play more in. And then, of course, there's the practical side. Um, We're really going to focus more on on the financial and the practical side um, because that's more what we focus in on. But I do want to state that, look, losing a loved one, no matter spouse or otherwise, is really incredibly draining and tough. And we and everybody understands that. Um, but if you're losing your life partner for maybe at five or ten years or fifty or sixty years, it's tough. This is the person that you chose to spend your life with, right? The one thing that we really do recommend and is really important um, is to find some grief counseling. Um, it's really needed. You know, most communities where we live have a hospice or something similar through the hospital through hospice through your doctor's office, somewhere, there are grief counseling groups, right? Whatever grief you're going through, you are not the first person to go through this grief. Others have done it. And there is help there, usually within your community, usually not hours away. It's not like you've got to go to a different state or a different city. There's probably a grief a grief group, probably 10 minutes from where most of us live, who will be watching this podcast. So I would urge you as, as a spouse, as a surviving spouse, seek out some grief counseling. And then, of course, you also have to be there for, for, for your family, assuming that there are children, right? Now, if you've got young children, it's very different than if you've got older children that are, let's say, out of the house and already have their lives established. But look, everybody's going to have some form of grief. And it's important that as a family, you kind of grieve together and, and get through it together but also that you seek a little bit of outside help too, just to get through, get yourself through the process. Okay. I think you've given us a nice overview. Now let's move to the next steps. Your spouse passes away. What are the first things that uh, you should do uh, and what can be pushed to later? Well, I I think the most important thing is, you know, is is you've got to deal with the here and now, right? You've got to deal with, with handling the will, the grieving process, you know, whatever, whichever religion you're in, whether it's, you know, wakes, whether it's sitting Shiva or whatever you may be doing. Mm -hmm. That, of course, is kind of first and foremost. But let's also talk about, you know, some things that people can do before somebody passes away, Bob. Okay, let's focus on that for just a second, right? You know, the first and foremost is people need to you know, work on some basic estate planning documents, right? The will obviously is the most important one that comes to mind for everybody. And really everybody should have a will. There's little excuse not to have even a, even a basic will, right? Dying without a will just makes the process even tougher for everybody else. Um, you know, instead of just pushing a small boulder up the hill, you're pushing even a bigger boulder up the hill because you don't have the will. And the will is just basically a simple document that states, who's going to be the person in charge of everything and where all of your assets are going. Now, if it's a spouse, in many cases, it's, gee, I leave everything to my spouse, right? So that part's not overly complicated, but not having a will makes it more complicated. 
you know, in lieu of a will, a lot of people more and more these days are using trusts. Um, and in this particular case, we're going to focus on a revocable living trust. So revocable, R-E-V, right? Revocable, meaning it can be easily changed. The person, the grantor, the individual who's creating the trust is also, um, it's their property. Um, the assets now go into a trust. Trusts read a lot like a will. However, a trust also appoints successor trustees. So should you have a long sickness and at some point be unable to handle your affairs, your successor or co-trustee can go in and handle everything relatively seamlessly. And then upon death of the grantor, the trust in essence becomes a will. The key thing that the trust does in this case is it avoids going to probate court. Not that probate court is terrible, but probate court is a process and sometimes can take weeks or months to get the process started with that. The next couple of documents are, you know, I'm going to call them kind of perfunctory documents to have, but things like a power of attorney. Now, a power of attorney is only effective while you're alive. As soon as you pass away, so does your power of attorney. And then there are other documents like a healthcare proxy, living will, and HIPAA forms. All of these forms allow your loved ones to be involved in decision making at theoretically the end of, end of life. What about those classic accounts that people open at the bank and they come with certain titles, so, uh, such as joint tenants with right of survivorship and so forth, tenants in common? Can you talk a little bit about those? Sure. One other thing just to mention, and I'll touch on that in a second, is, <clears throat> you know, when you're at the point of, you know, after the funeral, from the funeral home, I would strongly recommend getting like 15 or 20 death certificates. And that's going to become obvious as we talk through this. You know, typically the funeral home will provide you one or two. I would just say, ask them for 15 or 20. Yes, they're going to charge you 20, 30, 40 bucks for each one. It's a certified copy with a raised seal but you're going to need them and getting all of them at once, again, will help the process down the road, make it a little easier and quicker. So let's talk about, you know, the, the basic accounts. Of course, there are always individual accounts. So they're in the name of the individual. Um, and so those accounts need to go through an estate process because they're, you know, the individual is now deceased. The, the most common account that, that a married couple would have, let's say your typical bank account, would be a joint with rights of survivorship, J-T-W-R-O-S, right? In a joint with rights of survivorship, you and your spouse are basically equal owners of the asset. But when one spouse passes away, it doesn't make a difference which one, the other is the joint owner and gets all of the property in that trust because they are have the right of survivorship. Mm -hmm. Those kind of accounts, again, you have a bank account, you need to go with a death certificate to the bank to prove that, oh, the other party is deceased. Here's the death certificate. And then the bank will either open a new account for you or just change the titling on the account, depending on what that bank does. The other kind of account is a joint tenants in common, J-T-T-E-N. A little less common, but still out there. In this case, each joint tenant owns a particular part of the account. Let's assume for argument's sake, it's a 50-50 ownership. And let's just say there's $100 in the account. So the first tenant owns $50. The second tenant owns the other $50. When one party passes away, the one party is entitled to their $50 and the other 50 has to go through the estate process. There are times where a joint tenant's account makes sense. More than not, joint with rights of survivorship is what most people use. Is it safe to say that these uh, indications should be clear to the client on the statements, uh, joint tenants with rights of survivorship and so forth? Yeah, they, they usually are right in the title of the account. You'll, you'll see the, you know, the JTWROS or the JTTEN usually right in the title of the account. So you'll know very quickly which it is. So it's important that people gather all their accounts, banks and brokerages, et cetera. Oh, yes. Yep. Okay. What about company benefits if the spouse is still employed? Okay. <clears throat> so if, if the spouse is, is still employed, right, um, 
you know, then, then you've got to deal with the benefits, right, that you may be entitled to. So, the, you know, the, the human resource person is going to be your best friend in this case, right? Whether it's a large company with, you know, 50,000 employees or a small company with 1,000 employees, you know, reach out to the human resource person. They will be your, your real helper, a key person for you to really know because they can walk you through all the components of your deceased partner's uh, spouse's uh, benefits. So first, let's start with healthcare, right? Assuming that, let's assume that the deceased partner, the deceased spouse had the healthcare benefits. You as a surviving spouse are, are certainly going to stay on those for a little period of time, depending on what the company's rules are. But if nothing else, you do have the ability to go onto COBRA. Now, COBRA is basically forces the company, it, and the company does no longer pays for it, but it forces the health insurance company to extend that benefit. The only issue with COBRA is it tends to be very expensive. The positive of COBRA is there's no lapse of coverage. It continues at the same company. So COBRA can be a great interim solution, probably not the best longer term solution, but it's, it, it's virtually instantaneous. So that way your coverage hasn't lapsed. The next couple of pieces of it will be, let's just assume there's a 401k plan or other retirement plan. So if, if, if you know, the spouse had a 401k plan, hopefully you're named as the beneficiary in the documents. And therefore, you are entitled to roll over that into either an, a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, depending if it's a traditional 401k or a Roth 401k. Again, relatively straightforward, but having your HR person help you walk through the steps with the 401k provider will help the process. I would say more and more companies are streamlining this process. The providers like Fidelity's and Vanguard's are relatively easy to deal with on the phone to accomplish these rollovers, but they're probably going to retire a death certificate. Again, another need for getting a bunch of them. Of course, then there are also pension plans, right? Some companies, depending on you know how long your spouse worked there, could have a more traditional pension plan. Um, so you have to find out. Um, if there was a pension plan, and then if you're entitled to any benefit. In our case at Hightower, for instance, we don't have, you know, we're a newer company. We don't have a pension plan. We do have a 401k plan. But my old firm, Citigroup, I did, I worked there long enough to qualify for the pension. Now it's not very much. I think my monthly benefit will about pay for a dinner a month, so mm -hmm. to speak. But again, my wife will be entitled to it. So she would just have to go you know, find the paperwork, which we keep, she knows where it is, and just, you know, file the, the paperwork to start collecting my pension. Um, one, other, one other thing to mention is life insurance. A lot of companies offer at least a basic life insurance policy. Usually it's company paid. So in other words, the employee isn't paying for it. It's the employer is paying for it. Generally, not necessarily very large. It could be five or 10,000. It could be 50,000. But again, you need to get in touch with your HR person. They'll let you know what there is. And there could always be some other benefits out there. Um, again, the HR person is going to be your best friend in this case. What comes next, Peter? Um, well, so now you have to look at some of the, the other things like credit cards, right? Um, if you have a joint credit card with your spouse, you need to get in touch with the credit card company and say, hey, my spouse passed away. I need to freeze his or her credit card because, you know, you don't want that credit card being used uh, for fraudulent purposes. Um, now, the credit card company may just let you keep the same account. They may have you open a new account. But again, you need to reach out to any and all credit card companies to either cancel them, change them, update them, make sure that they're aware. And the one thing you have to think about with credit cards, and we all have these these days, are how many of us have subscription services on auto renewal, right? Raise your hand, uh, all of us, be it Netflix, Peloton, um, my Easy Pass, uh, any number of different things hit my credit card every single month. So it's important that when you speak to the credit card company, you remind them, hey, I've got all of these auto renewals, you know, what can we do here? In many cases, that look, the credit card company doesn't want to see these things start bouncing. 
they'll probably help you transfer them to your car. They might tell you how to, you know, you have to get in touch with um, Netflix or Peloton or Easy Pass to get them switched over to your to another credit card. But don't forget those things because otherwise, you know, you can't watch your favorite Netflix show anymore. You know, this this is all so helpful, especially when one thinks that you'll be under such stress and 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 perhaps depression. Yep. Now you mentioned things like Netflix. What about their social media accounts, Facebook, et cetera? Yep. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, five, 10 years ago, people didn't even think about all of those things, but now people think about them more and more. Um, a lot of times lawyers now have some standard language they put into into documents concerning things like Facebook and Twitter and those kind of things. Um, you know, you have to you have to break these things into two different things. You know, there are the Netflix and the Pelotons, right, which are a service that you theoretically, let's just focus on Netflix as an example versus Facebook. And I'm not trying to compare the two, but if you have a Netflix account, chances are the other spouse is going to want to continue that same Netflix account, right? So that's probably just a matter of changing the name on the account and putting a different credit card on the account. Things like Facebook may need to be shut down, but you may want to get some information off of there first. So it's going to be a little different. I don't think you can keep a deceased person's Facebook going forever. Chances are both spouses have Facebook anyway. But again, these are all the things, you know, our, our lives are being lived online, not just in, you know, Netflix and Facebook and things like that, but all kinds of things. So you need to, again, take your time with all of those things. The one thing that I suggest people do is, is as old fashioned as it is, is Keep a list of your different social media slash online things with <clears throat> passwords, <clears throat> you know, with usernames and passwords. Make sure your spouse knows where they are. Wow. It, it, the list goes on. I have more for you. Okay. Let's say I'm retired, uh, over 70, got other benefits, um, yep. pensions, whatever, Social Security. What about yep. those? Well, so... Yeah, that, that's the next. That's the next thing. So let's assume some. Let's assume both spouses are retired and both spouses are receiving Social Security, right? You need to, Social Security Administration is going to be notified through the funeral home relatively quickly. That's part of the process that kind of goes on behind the scenes. But you, as the surviving spouse, really need to get in touch with Social Security Administration. One, you'll probably see an increase in benefits, right? You're going to be entitled to portion of your deceased spouse's benefits in most cases, not all, mm -hmm. but most cases. There's also, I think, a very small death benefit that Social Security pays. It's maybe $1,000 or $1,200. Look, it's not much, but you're entitled to it. You might as well get it. Um, again, so there's the continuation of benefits. If you have minor children and your spouse passes away while they're collecting Social Security, um, your minor children are probably entitled to Social Security benefit until they reach the age of majority, either 18 or 21, depending on what the guidelines say. You know, we always recommend that our clients, you know, reach out to the Social Security Administration, make an appointment, go sit down with one of the specialists. They're very friendly, they're very nice, and, and they're there to really help you. Okay, let's suppose I or my spouse, depending on which one of us goes first, mm -hmm. has a pension and they're already retired. Well, again, if you have a pension, you're already retired. Chances are when, you're, when your spouse, deceased spouse who had the pension, elected pension payments, he or she elected some sort of potentially continuation of benefits, right? So let's just give you a couple of, let's just go through very simple examples. When you have a, a more traditional pension, at the time of retirement, you have multiple options. You could, you could elect to receive the max benefit, which will classify as 100% with no remainder. So as long as that spouse is alive, he or she will get the 100% benefit, whatever that is, $1,000 a month, let's just say. And when he or she passes away, that benefit is finished and that's the end of it, right? Then there's nothing left for the spouse. You've taken a little bit more than other options. Other options, a more typical option is maybe you take a 150, 100 slash 50. So in other words, you take the max benefit, but there's a remainder benefit. So maybe instead of $1,000, the benefit is $800 per month. But when you pass away, the benefit drops to $400 a month. So again, you, those elections have to be made at the time you retire. 
and they are generally irrevocable, meaning they cannot be changed. We often help clients figure out the best way to take a benefit. You know, the knee jerk reaction sometimes is always to take the most. But when you sit back and think about it, sometimes that's not always the best for the surviving spouse. Anything we missed here? Uh, I Look, I am sure there are things that we missed. We've only spent, you know, the last 15 or 20 minutes going through this stuff. Um, so, you know, let's just talk about some, some practicalities, some little kind of bits of things to do now, right? You, sh you shouldn't wait first and foremost. Look, talking about your death is never a comfortable topic. We urge people don't wait until, you know, the very end to have the conversation. You know, we've just come through a, a pretty, we'll just say interesting time in our, in our, in our country's history with COVID and the shutdowns. And, you know, almost 600,000 people passing away, some of them very unexpectedly. You know, I wonder how many of them never planned for any of this, right? So have the conversations, you know, make sure your spouse is involved. Don't just say, ah, I'll, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. I'll, we always do that with certain things. I think this is too important to just say, I'll get to it. Um, so it's not only having the conversation. It's, great. it's important, obviously, to start the conversation. But it, it's an ongoing dialogue. It's not a once and done. Okay. So part of it is to organize your papers. Take a little bit of time one rainy weekend, sift through the papers, get out the important documents, kind of pull them together. Your important documents, again, if you have a will and trust and powers of attorney, know where they are. Make sure your spouse knows where they are. But then it's also things like deeds on the house. Um, car papers for cars, any of those kind of things, your online passwords, any things that you think are important, company benefits, healthcare plans, all of that stuff needs to kind of be culled together. Um, a couple of things that we have, you know, a, sh a short kind of commercial for some things that we have here and do for clients. One is we give many of our clients something as really basic is, you know, and is ba basic these days, it's a loose leaf binder, it's a wealth binder. And the wealth binder has, you know, tabs in there and folders in there for all of these kind of things. So part of it is it's almost a reminder to say, oh, yeah, I need to find that. I need to find that. I need to find that. And it also is an organizational tool. The two other things that we've done that we have is, uh, oh, probably about six, seven, eight years ago, we wrote a white paper. Uh, it's about a 20 page document on what to do when somebody passes away. So it's got all of the things that I spoke about, plus many other things in some more depth, all the things that you need to do. And then accompanying that, something that we, we created a little bit more, more recently is kind of a checklist. And again, it goes through all of these things. It's very much, a, it's literally in a checklist form. Um, it's on our website along with the white paper. So they're there for, for our clients and anybody that's watching this video to, you know, to, to take a look at, to download and to use. And it's something we send to clients when, when this is what occurs in their life. Peter, um, where can people get a hold of that white paper? How can they get a hold of it? Uh, they just have to, you know, if you just Google Hightower Westchester, um, you'll go to our website and you'll look under publications and you'll find the white paper there. It's pretty easy to search. If you don't want to search our white paper, just email somebody in my office, email myself, email Ronnie, Roman, whomever, whoever you speak to in our office, email them and ask them for these documents. We'll be happy to provide them to any of you. Peter Lang, I, I, I got to tell you, this was one of the most informative podcasts. Uh, people will find it very useful. Thank you so much. Peter's managing director and partner at Hightower Westchester here in Harrison, New York. Peter Lang's the name. Thank you so very much. Have a great day. Thanks, Bob. Have a good one. Take care. Hightower Westchester is a group of investment professionals registered with Hightower Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC, and with Hightower Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Securities are offered through Hightower Securities, LLC. Advisory services are offered through Hightower Advisors, LLC. This is not an offer to buy or sell securities. No investment process is free of risk, and there is no guarantee that the investment process or the investment opportunities referenced herein will be profitable. Past performance is not indicative of current or future performance and is not a guarantee. The investment opportunities referenced herein may not be suitable for all investors. All data and information referenced herein 
herein are from sources believed to be reliable. Any opinions, news, research, analyses, prices, or other information contained in this research is provided as a general market commentary. It does not constitute investment advice. Hightower Westchester and Hightower shall not in any way be liable for claims and make no expressed or implied representations or warranties as to the accuracy or completeness of the data and other information, or for statements or errors contained in or omissions from the obtained data and information referenced herein. The data and information are provided as of the date referenced. Such data and information are subject to change without notice. This podcast was created for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are solely those of Hightower Westchester and do not represent those of Hightower Advisors LLC or any of its affiliates. Hightower Advisors do not provide tax or legal advice. This material was not intended or written to be used or presented to any entity as tax advice or tax information. Tax laws vary based on the client's individual circumstances and can change at any time without notice. Clients are urged to consult their tax or legal advisor before establishing a retirement plan.